All right. Um, I I saw I saw everyone's, and if I am not mistaken, I have to think about this for a second. But if I'm not mistaken, no one got it perfect. Some people did pretty well. People came real close, and maybe only because I'm grouchy that I didn't say it was perfect. <laughs> but no one got it perfect. But then again, no one was really totally off base. In other words, you are like 100% of all my other classes that I've ever had. All right, in that, yeah, you know, you 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 have a sense of it, but more practice will benefit you. And what I like to do, and we'll do this. We probably won't have time to finish it today because we have about 10 minutes left. But what I'd like to do is talk about the process of designing this and, and show you my thought process on how I would design this if I was doing it. All right? And uh, then we'll go from there. All right? And as you're going through this, keep in mind and look at what you're doing or look at what you have. And please feel free to ask whatever questions that, that you have. One problem, and again, there was, there was one team, especially that I was talking about this a lot, but this kind of comes into play with everyone, is number one, you do have to sort of separate the mindset between what the user interface does and what database constraints are. All right? This question pops up in a variety of different forms. All right? For example, one of the teams asked the question, if someone votes a certain way, do they have to stick with that vote forever? Can they ever go back and change it? In other words, my Android breaks and I go buy an iPhone. Can I go and change that? Well, that's actually a user interface issue, right? The database constraint is that a person can only vote once. So the database shouldn't allow two votes from a user on a question. The database doesn't care if you can go in and change it or not. That's an application issue, all right? Question. What about the user creating a new account? What about the user creating a new account? We can talk about that. Because then they could they could vote again. Because you're just cheating. So if you had, yeah, yeah, you'd be cheating the system basically. Yeah. You could skew the results. You could. Um, <laughs> given that this isn't like an actual congressional election or something like that, we would wonder how concerned we would be with preventing that. In other words, if someone is that fired up with doing that. It's an internet poll. <laughs> yeah, it's an internet poll, exactly. So, of course, they're fired up. What could we do to prevent that, by the way? Well, you check against the uh, registered email addresses. Yeah. You, you know, you could do a couple of different things. And, again, none of this is foolproof to someone who is hell-bent on gaming the system. But, number one, you can make the email address be... Um, their user ID. That way I couldn't create two user IDs with that. I'd at least have to go to the trouble to create another email account. All right. You could email confirm it so you couldn't just make up an email right. before they were registered. So you could do that. Um, I don't know if you'd want to keep the IP address because even that you could you could fake, right? Oh, yeah, and, and you or you could you could you know you could reset your router and get another IP address or go to an, you know go to the library or whatever. The bottom line is you, you have to look to see um, just how much care you'd want to take. If I were doing this, again, given the, the nature of this, um, I would probably do what I suggested, make the email address the key, or at least guarantee that it's unique so someone can't just simply make two accounts. Uh, I'd send an email confirmation, so it has to be a real email address. And then if they wanted to vote a couple times, Whatever, you know, yeah, more power to them. Pardon me? Well, not necessarily. You could just have a status for the user. Yeah, you, 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 you put them in, but you put them in as a certain status, and they could log on, but until they confirmed, um, they wouldn't be able. So you have to, you have to have something. All right, there's a couple approaches that you can take when designing a database, and one is and they're, they're cleverly enough called top down and bottom up, all right? Um, I definitely have biases in this case, all right? And you'll see that because I'm going to have a hard time explaining how you do the one. 
right? Because I never do it, right? But top down, bottom up. Um, top down goes from the big picture to the details. Bottom up starts with the details and goes to the big picture. So, the top down, the thought is that you start out by defining the big picture, the big players, the big elements of this, which are typically the entities, right? The entities that are involved. Then you look at the relationships that exist between those entities, and then you flesh everything out with attributes. The bottom up, I don't know what you do with that one. I don't know. You, cut, you start with the details, is what you do. Then you look at those details, and you sort of decide like what belongs together. And from that you get your entities. And from that you determine the relationships. And then you have the final product. You should be able to go either way and get the same answer. But I'm definitely preferring for this. Because first of all, just conceptually, it makes more sense to have a grasp on the big picture before you start worrying about the details. All right? One second. Secondly, I like this because this shows me different like levels of abstraction that I can show people. In other words, if I'm just previewing this with someone and they don't need to know all the details, I can show them on a very high level the database diagram and give them a sense of what it is. All right, as opposed to getting mired in the details right off the bat. When you get the details first, would that be like getting all the raw data in an Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, it would be like, or, or like writing down all the things that we have to store. Like we have to store. You know, we have to store categories, questions, possible answers, we, you know, doing it that way. I really think it's easier to cloud the issue that way and it's sort of going the wrong direction. So again, I definitely am an advocate of this. Bottom line is whatever you do, you know, go and, you know, Go cast some 12-sided dice and get the answer. I don't care as long as you end up with a database design. But this systematic approach is probably the better way to do it. Yes? I'm thinking the bottom-up approach might be more for like larger, larger products. Say this whole page was to be one part of a big website that also allowed people to order products. And if you want to take a bottom-up approach to a larger product, you say this is the one small detail I need to work on right now, and then take a top-down approach to the small detail. That's a good question. I don't know. I, I probably would take, I don't know, I probably still would favor a top-down and just carve out the problem in the sections, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. So, a couple things. First of all, Let's, let's make some rules and assumptions here. The way we choose to present our data doesn't equal the way we're going to store it. So the user interface does not equal the database structure. And I'm going to throw these concepts out, and I'll give examples of them, and, and, and hopefully, eventually, we'll get around full circle. What I mean by that is, this page shows the percentages that everyone had for this, that everyone voted in this poll. That doesn't mean that these percentages are going to live in the database. Okay? What do I mean by that? Gee, where are we going to come up with them if they don't live in the database? Well, the percentages won't live in the database. Maybe the raw votes will. So I'm not going to store 49% of the people picked Android. I may store that 98 people voted for Android, 96 people voted for iPhone, and 6 voted for other. Or no, no. Bad, bad mic, bad mic. I might store a list of votes. And 
On 96 votes in the vote table, people picked iPhone. On whatever, 98 people picked that. So I might store each individual vote is what I'm trying to say, not aggregated. So this in a way was sort of, sort of thrown out as, as uh, like, a, like a red herring, right? This, this may trick you into thinking, gee, I need to store the percentages. No, because the user interface doesn't equal the database design. I have chosen to present the raw total of votes as a percentage here. I could also show just the raw number of votes, right? So one good key of database design is the structure of data stays relatively static over time, but the way that it's presented can change. And again, you know, this is sort of a higher level of that principle of separating the content from the way it looks, right? The content is the number of, uh, is the individual votes that people have. I may show that as a percentage. I may show that as a pie graph. I may show it as a bar graph. I may show the raw numbers. Whatever. I could show it a million different ways. All right? But the raw data is still this person on this question voted this. This person on this question voted for that. Interesting exercise to think about, all right? Think of Lyon Community College recently celebrated its 50th anniversary, right? Yeah, I seem to remember. Yay. All right. Now, 50 years ago, let's compare the data that you might store 50 years ago with today. 50 years ago, there were students, right? 50 years ago, there were professors. 50 years ago, there were classes. 50 years ago, there were sections of those classes, right? 50 years ago, if you completed a certain number of courses, you got a degree, all right? 50 years ago, a student could have multiple majors, I would assume, anyhow. I wasn't, I, well, I was around 50 years ago, but I wasn't attending college. <laughs> I was, I, was on, I was in high school. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and so on down the line. The point is, if you examine an organization like a school, if you think on a database level, there ain't a lot that has changed. Now, you might say, well, there's web courses now when there wasn't web courses then. Yeah, that's a slight change, but you know what? It's still a course. It's still a course. And there were still alternate delivery methods back then. You used to be able, in the old days, to take a TV course, yeah. right? So really, there was a delivery method to a course back then. We've just added a new kind of way to deliver it. So, so the data, the, the entities that exist in an organization and the relationships between those entities is relatively static. Now, some of the details might change, all right? And there might be an extra entity or two. Back then, there was only one campus. Now there's the, what, the Wellington campus and the Ridgeville campus and all that. So I'm not saying nothing has changed. But on an overall structural level, it doesn't change that much. And that's good because the database provides a foundation. So you want the database to be handled these little changes without the foundation crumbling. Uh, I'm going a bit over time. I want to hit a more logical breaking point, and then we'll continue and finish this next time. All right? So, if we're using a top-down approach, which we are, something to consider. And I guess this, this is true whether you, regardless of the approach. Every piece of information... that you are given relates to one or more entity, attribute, or relationship. So in other words, if we just look at this, all right, 
we get two entities right off the bat. We know that there's a category entity, and we know that there's a question entity. All right? How do we know that? Well, because related, one category relates to multiple questions. Well, how do we know that that's just not a category with a bunch of lines in there for questions, where you could put as many questions in as you want? Well, how many questions could you have? Well, I don't know. Well, exactly, you don't know. So therefore, instead of building in a category with 20 slots, let's say, and then you can't enter in the 21st question, we're going to break that out into two entities that are relation, related to each other. The category entity and the question entity. And then we relate them in a one-to-many fashion. In other words, one category can have many questions. Each question is only related to one category. All right. Our top-down process is going to go like this. Identify the entities. Identify relationships. And define attributes. Now, I don't say this, this is not necessarily a absolutely sequential process like you do this one, you do all of this one, then do all of this one, and all of this one. Each piece of information that you consider about the database design may require you to go back and revise something, or maybe, you know, you won't define all the entities, but you see that there's a relationship. So it's not like you do this completely, do this completely, do this completely. In general, though, the first thing that you start doing is start looking at the information that you've been given and start identifying the entities. All right? So again, this isn't necessarily a smooth one, two, three process. There's definitely iterations with it. You loop around and you go back and reconsider things. And when you're defining entities, you might actually realize that you don't have another entity of a relationship and so on. But this is a general flow that we're going to have. So when we go over this on Thursday, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what are the entities that we see here? All right? And we'll go from there. All right? Then we'll define the relationship between those entities and we'll look at some attributes. All right. We will finish this up next time.